beginning. <laughs> that way we can make sure people who are listening online can hear me too. Ecclesiastes, and all I really need to say is that we, we started an introduction this morning, but I want to give us more of an introduction because this is a book that I think is really easy to misunderstand and it's not like there is like, you know, I've, I've got it figured out and I'm the one who understands it. Um, but I will say that I'm going to take an approach to Ecclesiastes that's less common among the scholars. And yet, as I read it and I read it again, it just seemed to be what made the most sense to me as I went through the book. Now, many people know that the word vanity shows up 29 times in this book, in verse 2, it shows up five times right there. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, or vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And we discussed this morning that vanity is uh, that which disappears, that which you cannot grasp. It's something that you try and get it, but it just floats away from you, and you can't get a hold of it. And so the idea is, is that he's telling everyone about this stuff under the sun, 27 times we see the phrase, under the sun. And there's a big emphasis on that. And so many people think, well, this is the sound of a guy who's lost his relationship with God, and now he's just kind of ranting and raving about how everything is pointless in life. That's part true. <laughs> the book of 1 Kings, chapter 10, it tells us clearly, or sorry, chapter 11, tells us clearly that he did walk away from the Lord. That his wives, his 700 wives, 300 concubines, they drew his heart away. And so he started searching and serving the, wives, the gods of his wives. His heart, and he started doing all these other things and seeking pleasure in other places. And to really summarize again a part of this morning's message, verses 1 to 11, and we'll kind of just continue on from there tonight. But it was that his father knew war. His father knew battles. His father was always in the battle, always fighting. And we said, the one time he didn't go out to war, as kings were supposed to in that season, we find him end up committing sin with Bathsheba. He was a warrior, and being in the game kept him sharp, kept him in shape. Solomon never fought a war. There's no battles in Solomon's time. There was peace during the entire time of his kingdom. So what did he make? He made shields of gold. He couldn't carry a shield of gold. He can't fight with a shield of gold, but it's real pretty. And he started getting into all this extravagance. But I believe, if you look in 1 Kings, at the end there, it talks about the rest of his works. It speaks about the rest of his works after it talks about his apostasy. After he walks away from God, there seems to be more works. Throughout the New Testament, Solomon is actually spoken of in a positive light, not a negative. And if he ended his story, an unbeliever and, and walking away from God, more than likely... He wouldn't have all these positive sayings about him. I believe at the end of his life, he did come to his senses. And Ecclesiastes might possibly be his book reaching out to people to explain to them that all that stuff I tried won't work. In many ways, this is his testimony. David had like Psalm 52, right? After Bathsheba, he prays his prayer. And it's repentance. Solomon may have had Ecclesiastes, and that's what actually John Wesley said, that the book of Ecclesiastes was to Solomon as Psalm 52 was to David, that this was his song of repentance, explaining, I tried it all, and I found out it all was vanity. So key points. I'm going to throw some stuff on the board, and we can look at this as we go through, but to say that this is just the rant and rave of a guy who's just lost all view of God which for what it's worth, I'll confess too. The last time I taught this with the youth on Thursday nights, that's the way I looked at it because that's the more common view. And as straightforward, it kind of looks that way. But as we examine the book more carefully, clicking, the fear of God is mentioned seven times throughout the book. It's that perfect number of completion and fullness. So we see it not only seven times, but in all four of the major sections of the book. He continues to exhort people throughout the book to fear God. Another thing we see is he continues to make an exhortation. And ironically, if you, if you know the numbers, the first three verses, chapter 2, 24 to 6, chapter 5, 18 and 19, chapter, 18, verse 5, chapter 8, verse 15, those are the concluding verses to those three sections of the book. And 9 is in the middle of the last section. There's four sections to the book as he kind of makes an argument. 
And so every section, he continues to say this. Essentially, I summarized it. Be content with what you have and receive everything as a gift from God. If I have this stuff, God gave it to me, and I can be happy with this. So he's encouraging his reader again and again to do that. Thirdly, he continues to warn that God will judge the righteous and the wicked one day. So again, although most of the book, the emphasis on the things under the sun, there's this continual going back to the things over the sun. 317, 8, 12 to 13, 11, 9, 12, 7, the latter portion, and 12, 14, all make this mention of God's judgment. And last but not least, I'll put it up on the board, or you could flip there, but like we mentioned this morning, so I'm recapping this. If you want to know the, how the story ends, what's the point? You can flip to the last two verses of the book. And I think it speaks volumes when the verse is introduced, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Psalm is saying, what is my conclusion to this book? What is the point I'm trying to drive home? He says, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So I'm laying the groundwork out so that as we then read the rest of the verses, if this is our foundation, we can interpret it through this light. Is Solomon just ranting? Is he just giving up on all life? Or is he trying to make a point to people? You see, Solomon had wide influence. Everyone came to hear Solomon. So some believe this was even actually like a missionary writing or an evangelistic writing. He wrote it for the world to read to draw them to God. And you'll see some of that in tonight's text as he's drawing people in. And this is, again, the reference in 1 Kings 3, uh, 4, 34. It says, all men and men of all nations from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. So people were always coming to listen to Solomon. So again, it's my conviction now and belief that, yes, this is Solomon reaching out, trying to appeal to the Gentiles, to the unbelievers, to the people on the outskirts, and let them know these aren't church folk. These aren't the Hebrews. They're not the Israel. He's talking to the other people the people of the world, and he's saying, guys, you're chasing, like we talked this morning, after the things that satisfy the flesh. They satisfy your emotions, but your soul is longing for something more, something deeper. And he keeps trying to show them, I've done it all. And it's, you're going to end up feeling empty. All that stuff is vanity. It's just going to disappear one day. If you keep chasing after these things, you're going to find yourself empty and wanting. So, let us dive into our text. We're going to start in verse 12, and we're going to go through chapter 5. And I ended up, I originally told people to read ahead to 6, because that's the halfway point, but 5 is the end of a section. And so we figured that's a good place, and I knew I'd spend a little bit of time doing an introduction this morning, or this evening. I'm tired. <laughs> this evening. So we're going to dive in, and we'll take this out, and next week we'll conclude the book. So in verse 12, he says... Well, I'll say this, from chapter 1, verse 12, if you're a note taker and you write in the margins of your Bible there, so you got it forevermore, chapter 1, 12, all the way to 2, 11, is an argument which I kind of titled, Pleasures Tested. He's now in the next, about a whole chapter, starting in the middle of one chapter to the middle of a chapter, going to basically explain, I've tried it all. So it's almost like another introduction, I, the preacher was king over Israel and Jerusalem. And I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under, the, uh, under heaven. This burdensome task God has given to the sons of man by which they may be exercised. So he's saying, like, I, I went out and actually did this intentionally. This was actually thought through. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity and grasping for the wind. For what is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be numbered. So often I see comments about that verse saying, well, Solomon's forgetting about God. God can make straight what's been made crooked. And I'm saying, no, no, I don't, I don't think he's forgotten. His context is under the sun. He's saying, under the sun, there's nothing that can fix the problems that you struggle with. But above the sun, above the heavens, there's a solution. There's an answer. God can make 
the crooked street once more. He can add what is lacking. And so that's kind of what he's pointing. He's trying to, almost like way of the master, for some of us who are going through that right now, he's pointing out the disparity of the people, trying to make them realize their need for God. So verse 16, I communed with my heart saying, look, I have attained great wis- uh, great." Greatness and gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge. So again, if you're a note taker, right there, you might write down 1 Kings 29 to 34, where it explicitly talks about how God made Solomon wiser than anyone who's ever lived. And so he was wise. He's saying, I'm speaking from authority. You should know what I'm talking about. You should hear and understand. I have authority in this area. And so in verse 17, I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I wanted to know wisdom, but also madness and folly. He said, I perceived that this was also grasping for the wind. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. You see, I think, and we'll make a point soon here, that wisdom is better than pleasures and all this stuff. That's the whole book of Proverbs we were just going through, right? That wisdom should be the chief thing. But what Solomon thought then, and he sought it out, was, well, if wisdom is better than money and wisdom is better than pleasure, I should seek more and more and more wisdom and knowledge. But the more he got, he realized, it's all going to die with me. It's, I'm still not satisfied even having all this knowledge about all these things. It says he learned about animals and the fish and the birds and the insects. He understood geological cycles and geographical things. He understood how the oceans worked and the mountains worked. Like he researched all this stuff to have all this knowledge. And a quote often attributed to G.K. Chesterton is that disparity, that place where you feel like utterly in despair, does not come from weariness of pain, but from weariness of pleasure. It's the idea of, you see, all of us experience a little despair in our life, right? We've had bad times come, but with bad times, you can always say, like, the sun will come out tomorrow. Like, you can, like, look ahead to better things, right? Like, well, I mean, can't get any worse than this, so it might be better. So there's hope. But when you're seeking out sex and drugs and everything else, rock and roll, he had musicians, we'll read about them later, and you've had them all, and you realize, I I can't get more than this. Like, I've done the best there is to do. Weariness of pleasure, all of a sudden, you freak out because you realize, I thought I'd get satisfied, but when I gave my body everything it asked for, I still feel empty. I think of Ryan Reese, son of Pastor Raul Reese, hearing his testimony before. I've always liked it. And he was in skateboarding, and he toured with a big shoe company and was doing all this stuff. And he talks about, like, how he would go to Playboy Mansion, and he would hook up with the girls. He would go down to skateboarding things. And so he's like, I had women. I had this. I had that. And he's like, I was in Panama, and he was high on cocaine and high on this. And he's in his hotel room, and he's just having a breakdown because he says, like, he's he was seeking pleasure. And then he just freaked out. And he talks about just getting his Gideon's Bible out and reading it and eventually finally calling dad and going home. He ended up quitting drugs cold turkey. And he was on some heavy stuff. That's not easy to quit cold turkey. But the idea was it finally hit him. I tried getting pleasure from things, but I received that level of meaninglessness or disparity when I realized it can't satisfy. So Solomon's saying, I tried wisdom, I tried knowledge even, healthy things, good things, but those things even, when I filled up on them, I was still empty. So aside from wisdom and knowledge, which is probably where he started and good things, he's like, well, if wisdom and knowledge doesn't work, let's try folly and madness. So chapter two, I said in my heart, come, I will test you with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure, but surely this is also vanity. I said of laughter, madness, and of myrrh, What does it accomplish? I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what is good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. The idea of folly is kind of like, I just imagine Solomon started being a thrill seeker. Skydiving, going to try that one. Going to try bungee jumping. I'm going to try, like, he's just going to go out and start doing these foolish things but look satisfying. I'm going to start doing some crazy stuff. 
And it says, like, well, I'm going to try it out to see if maybe that's where satisfaction comes from. One to three in this section, lust of the flesh. We talked about the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, lust of the eyes, those three things. These are in order here down to verse through eight. So in verse four and five and six, I made, or I made my works great. I built myself houses, planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards, planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. And, grove. and I see this as all the, the pride of life. He built big things so that he would be powerful. He had this big structure of buildings and fortresses and economy and all these things. And he goes in verse 7 says, I acquired male and female servants. I had servants born in my house. Yes, I had great possessions of herds and of flocks and all who were in Jerusalem before me or greater than. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings of the provinces. I acquired male and female singers and the delights of the son of men and the musical instruments of all kinds. Solomon wanted the Beatles. He didn't buy a record. He just called in the Beatles. And that was how he rolled. It was just like, I want a music, I just bring the musicians in. I want women, he had a thousand. I want this, I want that, I went and I got it. Want money? Again, this morning I did the math. Comes out to about $38 billion a year, $250,000 a minute, $2,500 a second is what Solomon was bringing in money-wise. You can't spend that much money. Like, you try and buy the Ferrari lot, and by the time you get off the lot, you've already made it back. It's like you're just trying to blow money, and, and he's like, yeah, I had it all, and I spent and I spent. Good reference, 1 Kings 10, 27. It said, the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones and made cedar trees as abundant as the sycamores, uh, which are in the lowland. Now, they have a lot of sycamores. We have sycamores in Grandview. I got a huge sycamore in my American sycamore, but still, sycamores. And the cedars were a very desirable wood, you know. And then, uh, but silver was like stones, gravel. Might as well just toss it out in the front yard because there was so much silver and gold in the nation. The idea was, too, it wasn't just Solomon who was rich. He made Israel rich. The whole nation was rich because he brought prosperity to the people. But the idea is, he says, I tried all these things. And so verse 9, it says, So I became great and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desire, I did not keep it from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked at all the works that my hands had done, and on the labor which I had toiled, and indeed, all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. You see, he realized, well, I thought that this would make me happy. I thought that would make me happy. And so Solomon, dare I say, God gave Solomon the ability, because God gave him the power and the wealth. God, Solomon said, what do you want? Solomon says, give me wisdom. God says, you chose wisely. I'll give you wisdom, and I'll give you power and wealth. God then enabled Solomon to be the guy that we can learn from by experience. They always say experience is the best way to learn, but the best way to learn experience is through someone else's experiences. Better you watch someone else burn themselves on the oven rather than you burn yourself on the oven, right? Better to watch someone else, you know, shock themselves before you go shock yourself grabbing some. As the idea is, I want to learn from you. I don't want to learn from me. And we can learn from Solomon. Well, he said it. None of these things will ever satisfy. And so he starts to question, what is the meaning of life? If none of this satisfies, what is the meaning of life? And that is basically the rest of this chapter, chapter 2, 12 to 26. So he says, I turn myself to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can man do who succeeds the king? Only what he's already done. Then I saw that wisdom excels folly. So he sees wisdom was better than foolishness as light excels darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. So Solomon's admitting it is, just like he wrote in Proverbs, it's better to be wise. But... In verse 14, second half, yet I perceived, or I myself perceived, that the same event happens to them all. So he begins to start talking about death. I can be the wisest guy ever. He goes, I'm still going to die, though. So I'm sitting here filling my brain. I like to lift weights. It's a hobby of mine. It's fun. And yet, very often, I do it because it's fun. 
I'm lifting weights and I'm thinking like, right, Lord, and this body's going to burn. And guess what's going to happen to it? It's going to get old. <laughs> it's going to break. The muscles will disappear. All these hours. See, like I like to listen to sermons. I try and redeem the time. It's my one happy, healthy hobby. But the idea is, is like coming to that realization, Solomon's like, I could be the smartest guy to ever live, but I'm going to die. And so if I don't pass that knowledge on, like what, what was the use of it all? So he's saying, even though wisdom is better than folly, we have the same event. Verse 15, so I said in my heart, as it happens to the fool, it also happens to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart, this is also vanity. For there is no more remembrance of the wise than of the fool forever. Since all that now is will be forgotten in the days to come, how does a wise man die? As the fool. Now Solomon was pretty special. We remember Solomon. But in general, right, you might have felt really, really happy about winning the high school soccer state championship. But in 17 years, no one like from the high school will know who you are. <laughs> and in 100 years, no one will remember the state championship. But maybe it was your life in that season. No one will remember these things about us because he says, hey, the fool who just did all this silly stuff and the guy who worked so hard to build an empire, there are a few people, kind of like the book of Proverbs where I said it's a book of principles. In general, people can build up great wealth. There's a lot of millionaires and billionaires. We have no clue who they are. We know a few billionaires in the country, but most of we don't have a clue who they are. And do we even care? No. So what was the point? He's saying you're just going to get forgotten anyway. Again, as a constant reminder as we study this, he's not trying to say there's no point to life. What he's trying to do is get the people who are seeking other things to realize they won't be satisfied. If you try and fill your life to be the smartest guy who ever lives, you're going to die. And no one cares about smart people. <laughs> Everyone likes, you know, cool people and popular people. And actually, he'll, he'll address popularity before the end of the night. Therefore, I hated life, he says in verse 17, because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me. For all is vanity and grasping for the wind. Like when he had this dawning that even though I'm so wise, I'm still going to be forgotten. He's like, well, shoot, then what's the point of living? He's making the point. And so in verse 18, then I hated all my labor in which I told under the sun because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he'll be wise or a fool. Yet he will rule over all my labor, which I have toiled, and which I have shown myself wise in the sun. This is also vanity. You ever hear the phrase, you know, trust fund babies or trust fund kids? Like those kids who's like, their parents were billionaires or millionaires, and they just, they never had to get a job. They're great people, right? <laughs> That's always a joke, because they're usually jerks, and they don't know anything about work. And Solomon's now saying, I worked hard, and he did to, in his wisdom, to establish, he's the only king to ever have a naval fleet in Israel. Like, he established a navy. He established lots of foreign trade. He did lots of good stuff. He goes, but at the end of the day, I'm going to leave it to some spoiled brat. <laughs> and the funny thing is, he says, well, who knows whether he'll be a wise or a fool. Rehoboam is his son. How long did Rehoboam last before splitting the kingdom in half? He lasted a week. One week, Solomon passes the throne down. Here you go, son. Solomon dies. Rehoboam's in. One week later, Israel splits in half. So Solomon was right to say, man, I do all this work to build this big kingdom. Vanity, because <laughs> my son's just going to blow it all. Uh, Therefore, I turned my heart, verse 20, and despaired from all the labor which I had toiled under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, yet he must leave his heritage to a man who has not labored for it. This is also vanity and a great evil. Once again, like you work to build a business. You put your sweat and tears into it, but you pass it off to a kid or sell it or whatever, and then that person blows it. So he's kind of saying, like, why did I spend so much time building this great big thing? Um, verse 23, for all his days are sorrowful and his work is burdensome, even the night his heart takes no rest. Talking about people who are working so hard to build something at night, they're up, they can't sleep because they're worried about this empire they're trying to build, trying to start a business, trying to do this, getting a second job. And so 24 to 26 are critical verses. And this is where I want to take a moment because the Hebrew is confusing. And so many Bible translations translate it differently. 
And so you can walk away with a different interpretation. I think a lot clenches on this. In our Bibles, or New King James is what I'm reading out of, in case you aren't, nothing is better for a man than that he should eat, drink, and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. So, pausing there, partway through, he kind of says similar things later. And many scholars think the reason that most Bibles translate it this way is because the Hebrew is different in this verse, but follow two more verses, a couple of verses coming up, um, they read really similar, so they think, well, maybe there was an editing error, and this is supposed to read like that, so it makes this one read like those ones, but I think this one was supposed to be different. The Young's uh, literal translation, I was looking at all sorts of Bible translations, just the first part, it says, there is nothing good in a man, just that first part, there's nothing good in a man is much more literal to what the Hebrew says. And really, the way I started gleaning out of it is it's, it's basically saying the word is no good, inherently found in a man. There's nothing inside of you, in real normal people, that he should eat and drink and should enjoy the good in his labor. That we inherently can't just be content with what we have. You get where I'm kind of going now? It says It's this idea that Nothing inherently inside of us is just happy. We're always longing for bigger, greater, and more. Never satisfied. It's just something about people. The pulpit commentary in translating this verse says, it is not good in man that he should eat. The idea is the good, the inherent, it's not in us that we should just be able to eat and go on and be happy. The last part of that verse in verse 24, it said, this also I saw was from the hand of God. And I think this is his first big point he's trying to make. We keep seeking other things. And I realize that people don't just seem to be happy with the basics. And those who are happy with the basics, this is from the hand of God. It's a gift of God to be just satisfied, to be content and just, man, like, Lord, I'm just happy to have a house. That's pretty cool because lots of people don't have houses. My wrestling coach was always like, you should be happy you have two feet. And when I was a high schooler, it's like, what do you mean I should be happy you have two feet? Duh, I have two feet. But now I'm like, wow, look at all the people in the world who don't have two feet. It's like, it's kind of nice. Thank you, Lord. Like, I have health. I'm breathing. I live in America. Once again, I, I'm thankful that I live in a first world country. There's so many things to be thankful for, but it's not really in men. And then verse 25 can be translated two ways. It's often disputed. Many versions translate it one way and the other. So verse 25 says, For who can eat or who can have enjoyment more than I? ESV reads, For apart from him who can eat or can have enjoyment. Or you could say, Who can eat or have enjoyment apart from him? Apart from him is found in the Masoretic Test, the Targum, the Vulgate, the Septuagint, Syriatic text. So there's a lot of old texts that actually say apart from him. Either one makes sense. If he's saying, this qualifies me to make the previous statement, who could have known better than me, the way the New King James reads, that's a good way of interpreting it. Otherwise, it's basically continuing the argument. Who can enjoy just the, the simplicities of life apart from God? And so verse 26 it says, For God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good in his sight, but to the sinner he gives the work of gathering and collecting that he may give it to him who is good before God. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. So I think this was his big point. He's saying contentment is something God will give to us. When we receive the Lord, have a, we're born again, have a new spirit, he teaches us how to be content. I don't need a thousand women. I need one. I kind of like having one. I like having one who God picked out for me. I don't need all this other stuff. We'll get it. He who, satis who desires silver is not satisfied by silver, man. Like, that's a verse early in my walk. Like, college, I was just walking with the Lord, and that verse jumped out at me, and I kept on reminding myself of that. It's like, he who desires car parts will not be satisfied by car parts. It's like, I keep thinking that. It's like, yeah. Uh, because if I get this, I need that. If I get this, I need that. And like the drive us, I need a new transmission. It's never going to, and my car would never be done. And I have a Mustang. That'll never be done. 
unless I'm one day I'm just done with it because I could just continue throwing thousands of dollars at that. And then it makes you sit and wonder, I wonder how many kids I could feed with that money. And it's like, I wonder how much I could do if I wasn't trying to have, because someone will always have a faster car. Everyone knows that, right? Like, you'll never have the fastest car. Um, you see people trying. Most people in Grandview actually don't care about having the fastest cars. Who could have the loudest car, right? <laughs> I love watching the high schoolers and their, their Civics with their chopped off exhausts, and they're super loud, and then they pull up next to a grandma in an Accord, and she's got like the V6, and she can just totally take them. But they're really loud. Ah. Oh. Anyway, so that's what I hate about my car. I bought my car, my little my Honda Fit, and it had like an aftermarket exhaust on it. I'm too cheap to buy a stock exhaust, but it's loud, and it's not fast at all. My 115 horsepower can pass a semi as long as we're on flat or downhill. Uphills, that's, it's sketchy to shift into third gear. And so the point is, is we won't be satisfied. I'm gonna, and we flip, we've already read this like in previous weeks because it's these Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, they go together, but I'm gonna quickly read this again with less explanation, because we've read it recently. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10. Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and is certain we'll carry nothing out. I'll be quoting Job again later. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, not money, the love of money. Money is a great tool in the hand of a godly man. Money can do lots of great things for the kingdom of God. But the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So when people say, again, that Ecclesiastes is just the ramblings of a guy who's walked away from God, I'm like, I don't know. That sounds a whole lot like Paul's talking there in the New Testament. Solomon's driving home a point. And so it brings us to chapter 3. Yep. I'm just reading it right there in your Bible. Look down. You can follow. A time to heal, a time to laugh, and time to weep. Bum, bum. Okay, so the point is, though, is that the birds did write a song. Um, this is such a famous text, probably because of the birds, right? But the thing is this, is that it's not supposed to be super beautiful and poetic. Like, there's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to pluck and a time to be planted. The idea was, it actually poetically in the Hebrew actually does rhyme. And it's interesting that if you read the Hebrew... In the English, they pick the good opposite words. They're all opposites. There's uh, seven pairs of opposites, or two sets of seven, really. And so we get this uh, two sets of seven, so 28. There we go. And in the English, they do the opposites. In the Hebrew, they understood it as opposites, but they didn't always actually pick the perfect opposite word. They picked a word that kind of worked, but it rhymed. So it actually, there is a rhyme scheme in the Hebrew, and you don't normally see legit rhymes in the Hebrew. Normally, they do their songs and poetry. But what he's trying to show, and it's starting in chapter 3, which is section 2, for what it's worth, that, those last three verses, that was the end of section 1 of the book. Now he's starting another argument that God has a plan. That's basically it. God has a plan. God is sovereign. He's in control. And so he's making the case of God's sovereign plan. There's a time to born, die, plant, pluck, kill, heal, build, break, weep, laugh, mourn, dance, cast stones, gather stones, embrace, refrain, gain, lose, keep, throw away, tear, sow, silence, speak, love, hate, war, peace. That's the idea is he's kind of showing God's got a plan for everything. You might make your own plans. James talks about how it's like, well, we say, I'm going to go and do this. But he's like, well, say Lord willing, because you don't know if we're going to be here tomorrow, do you? Because God's got a time to die, and you don't know what your time is. There's a time to build up and break that. We don't know what God's plan is, and so the idea is he's telling people, God has a plan. We should start learning how to conform to God's plan rather than making all these plans and hoping God will bless them. Here's my plan, Lord. Bless it. Often the prayer of the Christian. And so he's saying God has a plan. Verse 9. What profit has the worker from that which he labors? I've seen, and he's continuing this idea of God's plan. 
I have seen the God-given task with which occupies uh, the son of men are to be occupied. He's made everything beautiful in its time. He's put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. Something about us longs for eternity. Even the atheist. The atheist doesn't not believe in God. They're just angry at God. And so they deny his existence because they're mad. You know, atheists can get really vocal and really in your face and really this and that. You ever find someone who's just angry at unicorns? You don't, right? Because they're, they're actually not real. Uh, you don't find people who are angry at, you know, Cupid or whatever. Well, some people might be angry at Cupid if they're single, but you know. Uh, uh, but the point is, is that People know there's a God there. How can you be so mad at something you think doesn't exist? But that's the idea, is our eternity's in our hearts, but outside of God and his word, we can't figure it out. We're not going to on our own just discover God's plans apart from God. And so verse 12, he says, I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat, drink, and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is a gift from God. This is what confuses people. They think, oh, is Solomon promoting hedonism or Epicureanism? Well, Epicurus was a Greek philosopher, but the idea was that he said just, you know, give yourself whatever you want. That's the meaning of life. Just feed your body, feed your... That's not what Solomon's saying. Remember, he said, to be able to eat and drink and just live at peace is a gift from God, to have contentment. So he's telling people, don't strive don't go after all the big stuff. Just learn to eat, drink, and be happy with what you got. This is a gift from God. So again, I don't think he's pushing hedonism. He's just telling people to learn to be content with the simple things. I know that whatever God does, verse 14, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. So he's letting them know. And I think this is part of the evangelistic pull. He's now pushing people, saying, hey, God has a plan. It can't be changed. It shall be forever. You can't add to it. You can't take for it. Why does God do it? That you guys should fear him, have that honor and reverence. Remember, it's not fear like, I'm afraid. It's, man, like God's God, and I I need to listen to him because he's like Lord of all creation. It's a big deal. And you'll notice he uses the word before him. It doesn't just say fear him. Often it says fear him. I think this is part of the evangelistic pull. Fear before him. What is that implying? You need to get before him. You need to seek him. You need to approach God. If this went out to all the world, they knew where Jerusalem was. They knew how to come to the temple. They knew where to go to find God, and we know where to go to find God. Most Americans know in their hotel drawer, they can find the Gideon Bible. There's a reason it's there, because they know on those late nights, John 3.16, translated in like 30 different languages. You know, it's right there for them. They know where to go. And so he's inviting people to come. And remember, verse 15, he says, that which has already been and that which is to be has already been. He's speaking of God's outside of time. That which has already been, everything in the past, but that which is to be has already been. And God requires an account of what is past. Basically saying like God's outside of time, past, present, future, He is going to take everything. We all shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we read in 1 Corinthians. All right, so now he begins from here, verse 16 of chapter 3, all the way through chapter 4, the end of chapter 4, to come up with some counter arguments. Like, well, if God's all powerful, what are people going to say? So we're going to move through these. Um, But this is from 316 to 426. And he continues to basically, he starts each argument off with like, I saw or I began to consider. And so he says, I saw under the sun. So again, his emphasis is not taking God out of the equation. In the place of judgment, officials and people in leadership, wickedness was there. And the place of righteousness, iniquity was there. So he's saying, what's gives? Why, why do we have corrupt? Would you believe me if I told you there's actually corrupt people in government? <laughs> and so he's saying, but I, then verse 17, he replies, and I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time, uh, for the, a time there for every purpose and for every work. And so he says, yeah, well, you see corrupt leaders. If God's in control, why is it that we have governors shutting down churches? Why is it we have this and that? He goes, 
they'll be judged. So verse 17 answers. Verse 18 then is a new problem. He goes, well, I said in my heart concerning the condition of the sons of of men, God tests them, and they may see that they see themselves like the animals. For what happens to the sons of men also happens to the animals. One thing befalls them as one dies, so dies the other. Surely they all have one breath. Man has no advantage over the animals, for all is vanity. For all go to one place. All are from the dust, and they all return to the dust. That's the argument. The reply, who knows? And it's a rhetorical question. It's not saying no one knows. He's kind of just getting people to think. The spirit of the sons of men, which goes upward, and the spirit of the animal, which goes down to the earth. So I perceive that nothing is better than the man should rejoice in his own works and that he's as in his heritage. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him? So he's saying, they say, well, animals die, we die, we all get buried, dead and done. Well, he goes, no, you see, the spirit of man goes upward back where he came from to the Spirit of God. We will go back and be with God if that's our destination. And the animals go back down to the earth. He's like, that's, it's a different thing. We are different. There is an eternal end to this. And obviously, he wouldn't just say we are just like the animals because just a few verses earlier, he's saying that God's going to judge everyone and there will be a reckoning and will be a... So he knows at the end there's going to be a judgment. So he says, people should be happy with what they do. Now he lists a few problems... And they list the solution after those few problems. He says, verse chapter 4, I returned and considered all the oppression that's done under the sun. So oppression is problem one. And look, the tears of the oppressed. They have no comforter. On the side of, the, of their oppressors, there's power, but they have no comforter. Therefore, I praise the dead who are already dead more than the living who are still alive. Yet better than both is he who had never existed, who has not seen the evil work that is under the sun. So he's making this argument, well, there's all these sad and oppressed people would it be better that they'd never lived? The next point, we have a few points. Verse 4, the vanity of selfishness. I saw that for all the toil and every skillful work, a man is envied by his neighbor. This is also vanity and grasping for the wind. He goes, you try so hard to get the fastest car. You know what you do? You make everyone mad at you because you have the fastest car. You thought you'd maybe be cool. You think you're pretty cool, and you realize everyone else hates you now. It's even worse if you have the loudest car. And so, but that's the point he's saying is, well, what's the point of trying to get all these things I thought would be cool if now that I get them, everyone's jealous? He's like, well, that was dumb. And so he says in verse five and six, the fool holds his hands and consumes his own flesh, i.e., the fool folds his hands, does nothing. He ends up eating himself away because he doesn't work. But on the flip side, better is a handful with quietness than both hands full together with toil and grasping for the wind. Uh, we, we read many Proverbs that covered this. You know, it's better to have a house with love than, uh, with, and bitter herbs than a feast with meat. It's like, I'd rather just be at home and have some peace and just simplicity. I'd rather have a handful and some quietness than have my hands all full by all this toil and hard work. Lastly, loneliness. So it's the selfishness, being oppressed, now loneliness. Then I turn and saw... Vanity under the sun. There is one alone without companion. He has neither son nor brother. Listen to the reason, though. Yet there is no end to all his labors, nor is his eye satisfied with riches. But he never asks, for whom do I toil and deprive myself of good? This is also vanity and a grave misfortune. He's talking about being alone, but he says, well, why is this person alone? Because they're so busy searching after stuff. They're so busy going after stuff that they lose the opportunity for family and friends. And so what's the solution for people who feel oppressed, people who are chasing after things, people who feel lonely? Verse 9. It's a good one, right, Alyssa? Yeah, just did this at their wedding. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. I'll just throw, I'm a jokester, and I actually even write funny things in my Bible. In my Bible, I have two are better than one, dot, 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 thousand with a question mark. Because it's like, hey, he had a thousand wives. So I was like, are you, are you, you put that to the test, right? Two are better than one. Well, two are better. Anyway, two are better than one because they have good reward from their labor. For if, all, if they fall, one will lift the, up his companion. But woe to him who's alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. 
Again, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Now, this is a great marriage text. I know other weddings have had this. But, I mean, ultimately, it's not just marriage. It's talking about a companion. It's better to have a friend than chase a bunch of money. Because, literally, it's good to have someone who can help you back up again when you fall. These people, you know, we, we have in houses with these things called heaters and all these luxuries, right? I mean, they were used to sleeping outside in caves and wandering the fields. They had that outer garment. We always read about the outer garment that the, the soldiers, they, they uh, cast lots to see who would get Jesus' outer garment. Blind Bartimaeus cast off that outer garment. It was like their, it was a, the Snuggie. Is that what it was? It's like the blanket and a hoodie all in one. That's what their outer garment was. It was the one that you could not take from someone, right? You could not keep it as collateral because it was so critical because people get cold at night, and this was the garment that kept them warm. Jesus says when they ask you for your, your coat or your jacket, your inner cloak, Jesus says give them the outer one too. Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount. It was, you'd be in the cold, and you need this coat. Where am I going with the coat thing? Well, I'm going with, but if you have another human, you'll stay warm. And that's what he's saying. Like, these people are used to sleeping outside just straight up in the weather. But if you have two people, you will stay warm. And, uh, yeah, you get stuck in the snow in the mountains. You don't care who the other person is. Like, you're going to go and you're going you're gonna to get some body heat and you're going to stay warm and you're going to live. And if they, someone falls, they lift them back up again. In verse 12, though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. And I'll be frank and honest, I'd never thought about it until the day of Alex and Alyssa's wedding or the day before and just thinking about the marriage text we were going to do for their wedding, and it is, uh, we want our marriages to be threefold. Two are good, but having Christ at the center of your marriage is better. When you have God in there, that is a cord that was not quickly broken. When you have the people, you know what the best part about having God in your marriage is? Is that when Nicole and I fight, he usually intervenes. You see, it's not about if she's wrong or if I'm wrong. It's the fact that we're both probably wrong and he's right. And that's nice settling ground to settle on when you can both go back and say, yep, I'm in sin, you're in sin. Usually better for you guys to say just that you're in sin and let her figure the other part out on her own. Um, but the idea is, is like, yeah, having God in that marriage, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Better to be poor. And this is actually the, the last one, the last section, his last counter argument. He starts with the answer, then gives the argument. Better a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who will be admonished no more. For he comes out of prison to be king. And although he was born poor in his kingdom, he's telling a story, I saw all the living who walk under the sun, and they were with the second youth who stands in his place. There was no end of all the people over the kingdom he, that he was made king, yet those who will come afterward will not rejoice in him. Surely this is also vanity and grasping for the wind. What they're saying is, is there was a king, and he was foolish, and this young guy, he started from nothing. He was in prison, maybe born in debtor's prison, right? He had nothing, but he works his way from being a prisoner to being king one day. But when his kingdom passes on, or when he grows old and becomes foolish himself, the next generation is not going to like him or respect him any more than the last king. No one liked the last king because he was old and foolish, and this guy is going to probably grow into the same thing. So the idea is popularity. He's like, it's also vanity. Because it's just going to pass on by. You look at the Hollywood stars. And I was actually thinking, like, I think about every now and then, I look at all the, the guys who are like the action fighting, you know, cool movie, whatever, guys. And I thought about when I was a kid. And it was different guys, wasn't it? Like, there were those guys that were in all the movies, you know? And whether it was, you know, Stallone and Schwarzenegger and Van Damme or whatnot. And then there's a new generation where we've got the guys I don't know the names of because I don't watch enough now. But the point was is the Van Damme and them were better. But, uh, but also, um, but another generation is going to go. And, and many of us here can't name the generation that came before them. Many of us, you know, I like old movies, so I can name some of the older actors. But it's like, you know, I would be curious how many of the people in here, because we've got a good handful who are under the age of 30, you know, can they say who Yule Brenner is or James Coburn or Steve McQueen or Garner or I can go down the list, right? Basically, Magnificent Seven cast. But, you know, it's like, but they were the big stars of their day. They were so popular, but no one knows them anymore. 
No one knows the people. And your kids might not know Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and they might not know who, who uh, Sylvester Stallone is. And that's just the idea. He's saying it's popularity. It's vanity. It was cool for a while. It's just going to go away. Chapter 5. So now we have some closure. Watch your step. <laughs> therefore. So chapter 5 is my therefore, and it's closing our second section, the last of what we're doing tonight. Walk prudently. Some Bibles literally say, watch your step. When, not if, you go near the house of the Lord, the house of God. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. That's the idea. Is when you're coming to church, and I mean this for all of us here, like before we come to church, check our hearts. He says, draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they do evil. They don't understand that what they're doing is actually evil in the sight of God. People are actually showing up to church and they don't even realize that God's actually unhappy with them being there. Now, this isn't someone desiring to learn about God who's new at it. This isn't someone seeking the Lord who is even still a sinner. This is the believer who comes and doesn't check their heart. They don't check their step. They're there to check the box. Church, did church. You know, God doesn't care if you go to church if your heart's not right. 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23. Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and, and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than a sacrifice and a heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. God sees our hearts. He doesn't want us just coming and bringing an offering, bringing a sacrifice, bringing a, here, I came to church. I did my thing. I, I did my time, you know. Now I can go and, you know, uh, I can be let off the hook because I did my community service time for the Lord. I served in children's chin- ministry. I did, I did a nickel downstairs until all the kids, you know, my month was over. And then I'm back into the population. I'm back in the general cell block now. And, you know, we get to be here with all my peeps. No, the thing is, is like, it's, we got to watch our heart is what he's saying. Consider it. I know that we're drawing before God. So he's he's making this point now. Let's seek the Lord and think about it. Verse 2, he says, Don't be rash with your mouth, nor let your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Jesus says, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. It is a good idea to learn to listen as much, if not more, than you talk when you pray. Because God gave us two ears and only one mouth. We got twice the listening power. Let your words be few. So many people, God, this is my plan, this is my plan, this is my plan. Come bless my plan. God, I want this new car. Give me this new car. I don't know if you want me to have the car, but I want you to want me to have the new car. So can we, can we work on this, Lord? Can we do an installment plan? You and me, I go to church, you pay a, a down payment on the car, I show to church again. You, but the idea is, watch your mouth. Think about what you're saying. It's a good thing to think about this, guys. There was a, a song by Third Day called Offering. I used to love that song. You know, and I'll give you my life because it's all I have to give. Because you laid down your life, you gave your life for me. What can you offer God that he doesn't deserve? Well, was, you can think about that one for a second. What do you have that you could offer him that he does not rightfully deserve? Well, if you this, then I'll start reading my Bible. God's like, is this thing on, kid? You're supposed to be reading your Bible. Any? This is why you're in this mess. You know, it's like, well, go, Lord, I'll start doing this. I'll start doing that. He's like, no, those were the suggestions I gave you how not to get in these problems. Now you're giving them to me as offerings? It's like, that's the idea. It's like, no, like, like, you, God deserves our all. He deserves our everything. So when we start giving him deals, watch out. <laughs> it says a fool's voice is known by as many words. And there's Proverbs we recently just covered in Proverbs that talk about that. So he says in verse 4, when you make your vow to God, do not delay to pay it. He has no pleasure in fools for what you have vowed 
Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Lord, if, then I'll start this. And vows to the Jews, for what it's worth, we get disconnected a little bit. Uh, I'm sure many of us have said, if you this, then all that in prayer. But vows, there's whole chapters in the, in the Torah, in the first five books, about vows and how you pay your vows. And it was a real thing to them. So we're a little disconnected in understanding how important this information would be to them. But we get the general idea. So verse 6, do not your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God, which would be like the priest or someone representing God, that it was an error. Whoops, God, I misspoke. Why should God be angry at you, your excuse, and destroy the work of your hands? So, oh, you tell God it was an error. I love the one where the guy's falling off the roof of the house. He's like, he's falling. He's like, Lord, help me. Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Lord, save me. And all of a sudden, he gets hooked by a nail, and he's caught. Never mind. The nail got me, God. I take it back. I don't need to do it any. See, we always disregard when God actually answers our prayers. For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there is also vanity, but fear God. If you see the oppression of the poor, okay, verse 8 to the end. 8 to the end, he is now replying once again to some of the objections in chapter 3 and 4. So, and then we're just wrapping it up. He says, if you see the oppression of the poor and the violent perversion of justice and righteousness in a province, do not marvel at the matter. For a high official watches over high official and a higher officials over them. He's kind of saying, God's in control. Don't stress it. Moreover, the profit of the land is for all. Even the king is served in the field. So back when he was talking about oppression, the beginning of the section, he's like, don't worry about it. Judgment will take place. Verse 10 this is a big one for me. It's highlighted and boxed in my Bible. He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver. We've already talked about that, so I'm just going to keep going, but that's a big one. He who loves abundance with increase, this is also vanity. When goods increase, they increase to those who eat them. So what profit have the owners except to see them with their eyes? And they increase who eat them. What it's talking about is like you build this empire. Well, I guess we've got to feed all the people now. You'll find that as you get to these bigger and better places, you build that company, you're now in charge of a lot. You thought, oh, when I get to the top. No, when you're in the top, you have all this responsibility now. You thought maybe you'd be able to relax more. Uh Uh-uh, not the way it works. Verse 12 says, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. I go to work, I do my job, I come home. Like, I got some peace. Whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. There are many stories, like horror stories, of rich, famous people we've heard of who have sleep problems and insomnia because they're so concerned about all the things they're wrapped up in. There is a severe evil which I have seen under the sun, riches kept from their owner to his hurt. But those riches perish through misfortune. When he begets a son, there is nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, naked he shall return, to go as he came, and he shall take nothing for his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. Job said very clearly when Job lost everything, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord, Yahweh, gave, and Yahweh has taken away, but blessed be the name of Yahweh. Job had a lot. Job had a lot, a lot. Like if you hear, go back to Job 1, we'll get to Job eventually. He had a huge empire of stuff. He had a big amount of kids and family. Now, if you were told, God tells you you have the power to go and tempt someone, like, hey, Alex, I want you to go make this guy curse God. I want you to make him sin or stumble. What do you do? Um, I'm going to put some temptation out, leave him, leave him some thing on the computer, or leave some drugs, or leave some, you know, you, you'll find out what that guy likes. God tells Satan, okay, you can try and tempt Job. What does he do? Kills his flocks, kills his everything, burns his houses, kills all his children, kills all his servant, leaves his wife. Satan knew what he was doing. But the whole point was that he does all this, but Job's heart wasn't in that stuff. Job had a heart for God. That's how you can take it all away and say, hey, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Naked I came, naked I'll go. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What he's talking about here is someone who's worked so hard for all this stuff to give it to their kids even, but then something comes and takes it. If If your your heart heart was set on the inheritance 
and it goes away, you've lost everything. 16 and 17, is this severe evil? Just exactly as he came, he shall go. What did proffer for all his labor to the wind? All his days, he who also eats darkness, he who has much sorrow and sickness and anger. And so here's what he says, the closing point is, it is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life, which God gives him, for it is his heritage. If your emphasis is on, I'm going to enjoy what God gives me, you will never have lack. If everything you have is what God gives you and you enjoy what God gives you, you'll never lack enjoyment. But if it's the empire you desire to amass and you lose the empire, now you lost everything and you could get rich. Verse 19, as for every man whom God has given riches and wealth and given him power to eat of it, so he got it and he even gets to keep it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, this is a gift from God. For he will not dwell, this godly man, unduly on the days of his life because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. So Solomon just drives home the point. We cannot chase riches. We got to chase Jesus. We cannot chase all these things. We got to change God. Oh, I'm daring. I want to flip and read. Let's close reading the Bible together. All of us. Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke. Let's head over to chapter 12. I just read this earlier and it even almost brought me to tears just kind of reading it. Just, I know the words of Jesus are good stuff and I will keep my commentary to a minimum and then we will worship the Lord and thank him for all this amazing stuff he does. Luke 12, verse 22. Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouses nor barn, and God feeds them. How much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add a cubit to his stature, get taller? If you then are not able to the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, I, they don't sow. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Do not seek what you should eat or drink, nor have an anxious mind for all these things the nations of the world seek after. And your father knows that you need these things. God knows what you need. Seek first the kingdom of God and these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have. Give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. He says, hey, give money. He says, give money away and provide yourself a money bag in heaven that won't go away. I'm actually going to read all the way to 40 because I think it applies to us today. Lest, give away, be giving, don't worry, lest your waist be girded, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning and yourselves be like the men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, that they will open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and give him and have him sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or in the third watch, you'll find them so. Blessed are those servants. But know this, if the master of the house had known the hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter then chimes in and they start talking more. We're worried about a bunch of junk when we should be worried about the return of our Lord. And if there are ever signs and times that 
commanded us to do so, these are the signs of the times. Looking at what's going on in the world, looking what's going on at scripture, understanding the Bible, Bible prophecy, Israel, timeline, all that kind of stuff. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour. Could be a decade away. You know, if it means there's only, a, if there's still 10 years left, that means you only have 10 years to win your lost loved ones. You only have 10 years to make a difference. Only have 10 years to keep your kids clean and unspotted from this world. You only have... If you only have one year, how do we live? Worried about all the junk that everyone's chasing? It's a lot of wasted time. It's a lot of wasted money. Putting our money, our time, and our hearts into the kingdom of God. That's what we ought to be doing. So let's pray. Let's worship him. And uh, I'm excited for worship tonight. I just think it's going to be a good time. So let's uh, dig in and seek the Lord.